Um, like I mentioned, this is going to be an unusual sermon. It's not really a sermon. It's kind of like just sharing some stories and then what the Lord showed me about those. So I want to start out by sharing with you one story that happened to me this week. I'm not going to say any names because I want to protect this person's anonymity, but I had a conversation with somebody this week and this uh, woman came home with her husband and walked in the house and turned on the light switch and immediately the entire house blew up. There was a gas leak that had been building up all the time they were gone and just that one little spark of the light switch coming on made the whole house entirely explode. And I was talking to her about it and I told her how because her and her husband had a number of surgeries. And I told her how our church had been praying for her, and we got in the conversation. I told her I was a pastor. She said, oh, I didn't know that about you. And so we were talking, and um, she said, well, since you're a pastor, let me share some things with you. She said, a number of miracles happened. She said, the first miracle was when we got home, I walked in first instead of my husband. My husband always walks in the house first when we're there together. And if I would have walked in first, I might not be alive. I mean, if, if he would have walked in first, I might not be alive because I walked in first and I'm standing in the kitchen. And when I turned on that light switch, he was in the doorway and the explosion threw him out of the house and smashed him up against a, a cement wall. And he broke both shoulders, almost all of his ribs, his legs, and... Um, um, he was, and he had a concussion because his head hit the cement wall so hard. And she said, if that would have been me, I probably wouldn't have survived. And she said, when I turn that light switch on, I'm standing in the kitchen, and the next second, I'm laying in the basement floor because the floor of the basement exploded up. And the basement, or the living room wall, or I'm sorry, the kitchen walls exploded out. So I'd, I'm laying, you, you go like this, and the next thing you know, you're laying in the basement. Wow and all this debris is falling on me and it's on fire and I'm trapped underneath it and I'm trying to get out from it I'm trying to like what's going on here and I'm trying to get out and it's on fire so I'm on fire and she said I couldn't move because I found out my legs didn't work because her one ankle was totally shattered the other one was twisted badly she broke a femur she broke some ribs and um, so she said as bad as that was if I would have been outside in the doorway, I might not be alive. She said, another miracle was, in spite of all these surgeries and all that we've been through, she said, I've never taken anything more strong than a Motrin. Wow. And I said, burns are like the most painful thing. And she goes, I know, but I never took anything more powerful than a Motrin. And she said, now, this is the biggest miracle of all. She said, when I turned on that light switch, it only took a second for the house to explode, but it's like time stopped. And I could literally feel myself in the hands of God, like two big hands were holding me and protecting me as this explosion took off. And then she said, I'm going to send you a photo, and you tell me what you think of this photo. All right, you ready when you are, Baba and Danielle? I, I was able, Danielle was able to, can you see this photo? Now, notice it right in here. Some people can see it, some can't. Do you see a face? Yeah. It looks like, see this is where the house was. They're putting the fire out. There's the trees behind it. And it looks like streams of light coming down. Can you see a face in there? Some people can see it, some can't. On the cell phone, you can see it very obviously. If you can see it, raise your hand. Okay, all right. They're above the firefighter's head. Yeah. She said that's exactly a picture of her mother when she was 20 years old. And her mother's been dead for many years. Okay, you can turn the lights back on. All right. Now I'm going to tell you another story, something that happened to me. A couple of years ago, about three years ago, <clears throat> I'm out in the backyard pushing the lawnmower, okay? Just 
normal summer day, minding my own business. I'm just mowing the lawn, and all of a sudden I just started thinking about my mom. And I love my mom, and I miss her greatly. And I was just thinking, man, I wish I could just talk to my mom one more time. I just, I miss her. I love her so much. And, you know, I'm just doing that, thinking that while I'm going back and forth with the lawnmower. And Baba came out on the back porch and she waved the phone, which she does many times when I'm working in the yard, which means you got a phone call. So I turn off the lawnmower and I walk towards her and she says, it's for you. And I figured that or else she wouldn't be waving a phone at me. <laughs> and I said, well, who is it? And she says, I don't know, but it's a woman. So I pick up the phone, I go, hello? And she says, Dave? And I go, yeah. She says, hi, it's mom. What? Yeah, it's your mom. I said, I'm sorry, you must have the wrong number. She says, Dave, what are you talking about? It's your mother. And I said, um, I'm sorry, my mother's been dead for five years. And she goes, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. And she hung up. All right, that's weird. Now, the next day I go to work. And we had had a big event at work, so um, there's some cleanup need to be done in the prep kitchen. So I'm in the prep kitchen all by myself, unloading the dishwasher and putting some things away. And like the way the, just imagine like this is, it's a rectangular shaped room. And here's one door that leads down a long hallway that leads to the warehouse. There's a door here that leads into the auditorium, and there's a door here that leads into the first kitchen where my office is, and then over there is where my boss, Ginger, her office is, and it's all a glass front. So I'm over here with my back to all, all three doors, and I'm doing stuff, and as clear, as plain as day, I heard a very soft, gentle female voice say, Thank you, Dave. And I just turned around thinking, oh, Ginger walked in and I didn't hear her, so I turned around and there's nobody there. So I thought, well, that's weird. Maybe she, maybe I missed her. Maybe she walked right through and, you know, my hearing's not the greatest. So I opened the door and I looked and here she is, like 40 feet away in her office, behind glass doors, talking to someone on the phone. So I go out the door to the auditorium. The lights are out. There's nobody in there. So I go over to this door and I look down the long hallway to the warehouse. There's nobody there. Now I know that I know that I know I heard a voice. All right. Let's go back a little bit further. About 35 years ago, my Uncle Sammy, I had an Uncle Sam. I really did. <laughs> and he was my godfather. So Uncle Sam was my godfather. But my Uncle Sammy had um, a heart attack when he was 50 years old and he had five bypass surgeries. And he's, you know, coming out of the surgery and he's in the hospital bed and he looks over and he feels something and he looks over and here sitting next to his bed is my grandma Tina and she's holding his hand and she's not saying nothing, just smiling, patting his hand. And he looks and goes, wow. And he goes, wait a minute, grandma Tina's been dead for 25 years. Then, another story, even before that, when I was seven years old, my, uh, my Aunt Dolly was at home. You know how I've told you I had five dads? Well, also I also had three moms. My grandmother, my mom, and my Aunt Dolly, who was my mom's sister. And um, I would go live with one or the other, depending on what was going on in my mom's life. But my Aunt Dolly was very important to me. So my Aunt Dolly, it's in the middle of the day, and um, or near the end of the day, my Uncle Verge is at work, her kids are at school, my cousins Tina and Peggy. So she's in the kitchen all by herself and she's doing some stuff by the sink and she turns and looks and there's my grandpa standing in the door, smiling at her. And she goes, oh, Dad, I didn't know you were here. I just put on a pot of coffee. Sit down, I'll pour you a cup. And she goes over to get a cup of coffee and um, the phone rings in the kitchen. She turns and looks and my grandpa's not there. So she thought oh, he must have went use the bathroom while I'm getting this coffee. So she picks up the phone and says, hello, and it's my grandma's neighbor, Olga. When I was a little kid, my grandma would say, Dave, go get some oleo from Olga. And I'd say, oleo from Olga, oleo from Olga. So, just a little side note. So Olga's on the phone talking to my Aunt Dolly, saying, Dolly, I'm so sorry, but your mom, she's too upset she can't talk. And my Aunt Dolly, what are you talking about? She said, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, but your, your dad died. And she said, that's ridiculous. He was just in my kitchen a second ago. 
And she says, Dolly, I'm telling you, your grandma woke him up and he, he was dead. He died in his sleep. So she hangs up the phone and she goes walking through the whole house. No grandpa, her dad. All right. And you're saying, okay, you're kind of weird today, Pastor Dave. <laughs> I bet you you have stories similar to that in your family. So the question is, what in the world's going on? What does this mean? I want to share with you a few scriptures, of course, because scriptures are what give us clarity. In 1 Corinthians 14.33, it says this, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of saints. Now, when things like that happen, you get confused. Like, what does that mean? Like this woman whose house blew up. Does that mean by seeing that face in there, is that telling us? Is this some kind of godly message that her mother came and she's hovering over the house and it was her mother's hands that were protecting her? Does that mean that my mother, God sent a message from heaven from my mother to tell me, thank you, Dave, because I led her to the Lord and I led her, her, my stepdad, her last husband, to the Lord before they died and they're both in heaven. Is that what that means? My, my aunt seeing my grandfather. What does that mean? Well, God's not the author of confusion. Something else to consider. 2 Corinthians 11, 14-15 And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Satan doesn't come as a big red monster with a pitchfork. He comes as an angel of light. In 1 John 4.1 it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. That word try the spirits, that word try means like um, um, I'm not going to say this word right, a metallurgist, not a meteorologist, but someone who works with metals. Metal. They, yeah, you say Metal. That's easy for you to say. <laughs> I can never say that word. Right. He'll take certain chemicals and different things he does to see is this fool's gold or is this real gold? And what carat gold is that? There's things that they're trying. And that's what it means here. When something spiritual happens, and by spiritual, I mean something that's not physical. We automatically just want to say, oh, it's got to be God. But I've told you many times before, there's the supernatural and there's the paranormal. The word super <coughs> means, the prefix super means above. Those are things that come from God. But the paranormal, the word para means around. There's a spirit world going on around us right now. So... What is happening? <clears throat> In Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 10 through 12, it says this, There shall not be found among any of you that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. You know there's a lot of motivational speakers when you go to their seminars at the end of the meeting, if it's a week or a weekend or whatever it is, to show you mind over matter. They have you walk through fire. <clears throat> Well, let's see what God has to say about that. Or he that useth divination, oh, the divining rods to see where there's water. Or a consulter, or an observer of times, astrology. Or an enchanter, someone who uh, summons up with spells. Or a witch, pharmacia, mixes together different drugs to put you in a hallucinogenic state or a charmer, or an, an, a, a consulter with familiar spirits. Now that word familiar and spirits are both the same Hebrew word, and you know what it means? It's really weird. It means water skin bottle. What? And what I, I prayed about that, what I believe that means is a water skin bottle. You can't just, can you hold water in your hand and just let it stay in that shape? You gotta put it in something. So they used to put them in wine skins, like any kind of liquid, 
because that's what contains this thing. Well, a spirit is ethereal. It can't be touched. It's got to be put in something physical or a physical form. So a familiar spirit is a spirit that comes in a form that's familiar to you, like a dead loved one. Or a necromancer. The word necromancer means one who invokes the dead. Well, what does God think about all this? He says, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. I learned a long time ago, stay away from the abominations. That's bad, not good. So, all these occultic practices, seances, mediums, tarot cards, all these things, what you're doing is it's an avenue to tap into the paranormal world. When I used to do hallucinogenics, there's a reason Jim Morrison called the name of his band The Doors, because of Aldous Huxley's uh, book, The Doors of Perception. When you do enough hallucinogenics, eat some magic mushrooms, a little uh, mescalito root or some LSD, you're tapping into the paranormal world that's around you. Paul said the things that are seen are temporal. I can see you. A hundred years from now, your body will not be here. But your spirit's going to live on forever. And there's a spirit world going on all around us right now. And you can tap into that. And all these things that he just mentioned are an abomination to him. Because you know what? It all goes back to what Satan said to Adam and Eve in the garden. You shall eat of this fruit. And you shall know and you shall be like the gods. Now, I just want to share two scriptures with you in Leviticus that gives a little bit more clarity. Le Leviticus 20 and verse 6. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go whoring after them. That's what we're, we're whoring. Like if you're a man driven with lust for women, you go whoring after other women. Or you're a woman driven with lust for other men, you go whoring after them. Or nowadays, you could go whoring after a doorknob. I mean, there's all kinds of genders and who knows what. But you're lusting after. Some people have a lust for the occult world. It's very exciting. It titillates the flesh. That's why people go to horror movies. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. The spirit of fear is very entertaining. It's titillating to the flesh. And those that go whoring after that, God says, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. In Leviticus 20:27, 20, A man also or a woman that have a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones and their blood shall be upon them. So God takes it kind of serious. He doesn't want us Delving into the paranormal world and, you know, Ouija boards and tarot cards and all these other things. There's a lot of video games out there. There's a game, I think it's called Hell, where you go into Hell and you fight demons all day long. And then when you get to the end, if you beat all the demons, you get to get out. Well, the best thing is just don't go to hell in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine working all day long, struggling, fighting traffic, fighting your boss, paying your bills, and then to relax, you go to hell and fight demons? <laughs> well, that's what some people do. But this familiar spirit, I believe, from what God's Word is telling me, that, that spirit that my Uncle Sammy saw sitting next to him patting his hand. See, there's a problem with that whole situation. My Uncle Sammy was not a Christian. And I have no indication that he died a Christian man. And my Grandma Tina raised him when he was a little boy. But my Grandma Tina was from Yugoslavia and she was a practicing witch. So I don't think God would send her to come to console poor Uncle Sammy. That was a familiar spirit. My Aunt Dolly that saw my grandpa, my Aunt Dolly, she's a Christian, she's in heaven now because I prayed with her before she died, but at the time was not a Christian. And my grandpa, he died when I was seven, and I pray all the time that Lord somehow you send somebody across his path and he got saved and he's in heaven now, but every indication is he was not a, a Christian man. 
So why would God send him to come and talk to my aunt unless to put this spirit of confusion to get people to say, oh yeah, we can have inner connections and we can communicate with the dead. Now, this is a touchy subject because so many times this happens to people when a loved one dies and they say, don't you tell me that wasn't of God because it makes us feel good. Like my, my one Aunt Peggy, I, I prayed with her, she had a stroke and I prayed with her and I just pray that she got saved but just before she, at, at the funeral, near the end of the, the, the funeral service, before they took her to the, um, the grave site, I was sitting there and I was just saying, Lord, I, just, I hope that something registered with her. I know your word does not return void. I hope it touched your spirit. And light came through this stained glass window and shined right on the casket. And I could be totally wrong, but I just, to me, I'm going to say, okay, Lord, that was a sign that she's with you. Maybe not. I don't know. I don't hang my hat on it, but it's kind of a nice, you know, affirmation. Now, if my Aunt Peggy appears to me and says, Hey, yo, Dave, I made it to heaven. Don't worry. That's a familiar spirit. God doesn't want us talking to the dead. You know, when somebody dies, so many times people say, Well, don't worry. They're with you. They're looking down upon you. No, I don't believe that's true because the Apostle Paul said, Absent from the body is present with the Lord. And they're not looking down on you. They don't know. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Do you want your dead grandma to see everything you've ever done since she died? I don't. <laughs> She's got her own business. In the book of Revelation, for all the saints that were dead, Jesus says, go lay under the altar and just rest for a while until everything has been fulfilled. Now in, Re in Hebrews it says, but we're encompassed about why so great a cloud of witnesses. And see, that's all your loved ones in a big spiritual amphitheater watching you, cheering you on. I don't believe that's what it's referring to because that's Hebrews chapter 12. And that's after Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith where it talks about Abraham and Moses. These are the ones, the testimony that they gave us, those are the ones that are cheering us on. But in the spirit world, there's godly angels saying, come on, you can do the right thing. And there's fallen angels saying, oh, come on, just go, come this way. Listen to me. And they're trying to stir up all this confusion. I'm sure you've heard of uh, those that go through past lives regression. And what they do is they go see a hypnotist and they get hypnotized. So of your own free will, you put yourself into a state of suggestion. And you're willing to receive the suggestion of spirits. And they'll say, Dave, back in 1848, you were a teacher by the name of John Brown that lived in Manchester, England. And then they'll flood my head with all these images and then I wake up out of the trance and I go, wow, I really did live before. And then I get on Ancestry.com and I do get on the internet and I look and there really was a guy named John Smith or John Brown in 1848 that lived in Manchester, England and he was a teacher. So I get in a plane and I fly over there and I look up where his gravesite is and I stand at his grave and I look, John Smith, 1848, teacher. And I'm saying, and I, of course the devil will give me a few goosebumps and I'll say, wow, I really did live before. All of that just to make us go along with what the very first recorded words that man has ever heard from Satan. And it's in Genesis 3. Hath God said? All of that to cast doubt on the Word of God. Because Hebrews says it's appointed unto man once to die, then the judgment. We didn't live many, many lives, and we're not going to live many, many other lives. So, what can happen, you think the devils don't know that there was a John Smith that was a teacher in Manchester, England in 1848, and he can put those thoughts in your head? Back when I was a Rosicrucian and I was in the astral projection and I thought I would, my soul was traveling all over. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. If your soul leaves your body, you're dead. But I would put myself into a self-hypnotic trance and they could flood my head with all these images. Many people throughout history have had apparitions of the Virgin Mary. 
at Magigorie. Many people showed up to see the Virgin Mary show up. And then those three little three uh, kids, they saw her a number of times. At one place, um, the name of the town escapes me, you might remember, a hundred thousand people at one time saw the Virgin Mary and then the sun started to dance in the sky. And it's, oh, that's it. Mary's talking to us. Well, necromancy is communication with the dead, and Mary is dead. We don't talk to Mary. We talk to Jesus. When Mary was here on earth at the wedding, and the, and the servants came to her and says, what should we do? And she says, whatever my son tells you to do, do that. If we could talk to the real Virgin Mary, she'd say, what are you talking to me for? Whatever my son tells you to do, do that. And all these are to cast doubt and to make us think, oh, maybe my, my dead mother is going to protect me. And then we start talking to them. Or those that talk to statues of the dead saints. If you could talk to the real Peter, you'd say, don't talk to me. But remember when Peter, James, and John were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? And they're like all excited. Here's Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah. Now Moses was dead because he died and the Lord buried his body. Elijah didn't die. He never died yet. He went up in the chariot of fire. It was a rapture. And Jesus is talking to him. And Peter says, oh, Lord, it's so good that we're here. Let's build three tabernacles and just hang out here. We'll set up a psychic reading sign on the on the Temple Mount here. We could get a, We could make a fortune. And a cloud comes over them. And a voice comes out of the cloud and says, Behold my son, hear ye him. You want to talk to somebody spiritual? His name's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living Christ. Yeah. You don't talk to any other dead people because they will lead you astray. In Matthew 24, in verse 24, it says this, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. There's so many signs and wonders that can take place to deceive people. And how do you get deceived? God has given us the confines of where we know that we're safe. I've told you the story before, but I'll tell you quickly because it, it bears repeating. They did a study with um, a bunch of sixth graders. And they took them in a bus out to this field where the field's wide open and they had the most up-to-date playground equipment and they opened the bus doors and they said go play and the kids got out of the bus they looked around and they kind of huddled up with each other and they went over and then they would play on the swings and then they'd get together and they'd go over and then they'd play on the slides and then they'd kind of look around and then they'd get a couple of them together and they'd go over and they'd play on the merry-go-round and they did that for a couple hours and they you know as a huddle came back got in the bus and drove away Nobody told them what to do. They just observed them. Then, a month later, took them back to the same place, the same playground equipment, except they put a fence all the way around it. And they said, okay, kids, go play. Now, you can say, well, it's because they're used to it now, but I don't believe so, and neither do the people that did this study. The kids ran out of the bus, and they went and played on all the, th all the toys, and they would run individually from one toy to the next, and they would play, and then they'd run over, and they'd bounce up against the chain link fence and put their fingers on it and push the fence and look through and then they go play again. Huh. And what they discovered, the conclusion they came up to, if people know their boundaries, they feel free. But we live in a world that says to our kids, oh, we don't care what you do, we just want you to be happy. Well, what in the world does happy mean? Our Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights gives us the pursuit of happiness, but nobody promises you to be happy. And what is happy anyhow? It's like a butterfly. One day you're happy, the next day you're not. If you have this ambiguous thing, go be happy. We need direction. What they used to do is if you were a, a, sh a shoe cobbler, you'd raise your son to be a shoe cobbler. He had some direction. Now they might vary from that. And it's the same thing with us. <coughs> God's given us parameters where we can feel safe. And you know what those parameters are? Genesis to Malachi, 
Matthew to Revelation. If it's not in there, I don't want it. I don't care how good it feels. I don't care if I get goosebumps. I don't care if it makes me smile. I don't care if 10,000 people are doing it. If it's not in those parameters, I don't want it. And Jesus said, there's going to come many who show signs, great signs, great miracles, and wonders that even the very elect could be deceived. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, it says this, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. It may seem right. Boy, that, you know, when my, I'm thinking about my mom. Out of a clear blue sky, then all of a sudden, like within a matter of moments, I get a phone call from a woman saying, Come on, Dave, it's me, your mom. I mean, what are the odds of that? It seems right. And then the next day to hear a voice, thank you, Dave. And I, I've been praying about it and thinking about it. What, what does that mean? And I realize what it means is the devil is saying, well, Dave, we know you're a Christian. We know you believe the Word of God. But if we give you a goosebump experience, maybe then you'll kind of loosen up for when other people have goosebumps experience and say, well, yeah, I had that too, so maybe it's okay if you do. And then the next thing you know, it's okay to talk to your dead mother. It's okay to talk to your dead grandpa. And when you need guidance, you say, Grandpa, what should I do? Instead of Jesus, what should I do? Holy Spirit, you show me the way to go. We're not supposed to talk to the dead. It's called necromancy. God doesn't like it. It's called an abomination. Now you may say, oh, come on, Pastor Dave. You're jumping at conclusions. You're making a big deal over nothing. Revelation chapter 13. Isn't it funny how everything always ends up in Revelation? <laughs> I guess that's the last book of the Bible. That's why. Revelation chapter 13, and I want to read verses 11 through 14. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Another beast means there was a first beast before him. The first beast was the Antichrist. They're both guided and led and directed and get their power from the dragon, who's the devil. But this other beast, he has two horns like a lamb. The only problem with that is lambs don't have horns. So he's as gentle and meek and mild as a lamb. You've heard of wolves in sheep's clothing? Well, this is a dragon in sheep's clothing, and he speaks as a dragon. The words that are coming out of his mouth are demonic. They're guided by the dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. And he causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And how does he do that? This false prophet, the leader of the one world religion, is going to get everybody in the world to follow the first beast, who is the Antichrist, the political leader of the world. And how is he going to do that? He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which he had the wound by a sword and did live. Now the reason that I think this is a big deal is because someday it's going to be a worldwide deception to the point where Jesus said, if I don't shorten the days, if I don't say, oh, game over, everybody on earth will be deceived because these signs and these wonders and these miracles are going to be so real and people are going to have a loss of spiritual discernment. Why do you think one of the gifts of the Spirit is discernment? Because we need it more so now than ever before. That if Jesus didn't shorten the days, everybody would fall for this guy. They'd all say, yeah, maybe that first beast, maybe that Antichrist is a good guy. Maybe I should worship him. In conclusion, Matthew 24, 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Why would Jesus say that? Because there's going to be people that are going to try to deceive you. Now, I know this wasn't, you know, a jumping up and down, hallelujah, that's an exciting kind of message. 
but it's not meant to be. It's a warning. And I believe it's a warning to all of us. Now, I like to think of myself as a solid rock, standing on God's Word Christian, but I'll tell you, for a couple of years, that experience with me in the backyard and this phone call and this thank you, Dave, kind of had my head twisting. Like, what's that mean? I mean, I know, I'm not going to start praying to my mom. You know, I'm not going to do that. That's necromancy. But did God really send a message all the way from the third heaven? My mom said, oh, Lord Jesus, can you go down and just tell my son how, how grateful I am that he led me and my... my uh, husband Gus to you and that we're here and I thought well maybe that's what it means but I don't think that was it at all I think that voice that sweet little voice was Satan coming as an angel of light I don't need to hear a voice say thank you Dave I'm going to see my mama in person someday and I'm going to see her dancing on streets of gold with all my other relatives that I led to the Lord that's going to be my reward I don't need any confirmation now again, some of you, I'll bet you, I'll bet you a dollar and a nickel. Almost everybody in here's got some kind of story like that, where you had something like that as a confirmation that you took it as. Well, that means, yeah, my my great my aunt Maud really did go to heaven, and I don't want to steal that from you, but I'm just warning you, don't hang your hat on it. You know when they. Uh, used to have the guys that would build those gigantic skyscrapers and they'd walk on those skinny little beams that were hundreds of stories up. You know what the, the saying was? They'd say to all the newbies that came in, they say, don't lean against the wind. Because you'd be walking on that beam and the wind's blowing this way today and you're walking and you're kind of leaning on it so you don't get blown that way. Well, the wind can shift. And guess what? Down you go, a hundred stories. All I'm telling you is if you have some kind of goosebump experience and you can't understand it, if it's truly a message from God, you say, well, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm still going to keep following you. I'm still going to listen to your word. But don't hang your hat on it. Don't lean into the wind because the devil, he's trickier than we can ever even imagine. And I'm not saying that to put fear in you. I'm just saying what Jesus said. Take heed lest any man try to deceive you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I said what I believe you wanted me to say. And Lord, I know the day and the hour that we're living in. And I know, Lord, you love us. And you said whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And the way we get free is you said you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. So, Lord, I believe that as the days progress, we're going to start seeing more and more of these paranormal things. We're also going to be seeing supernatural things. Lord, give us the discernment to try the spirits and know what's of God and what's not. Because ultimately, all we want to do is follow you, Lord Jesus. That's all we want to do. So, Lord, I pray that that spirit of confusion will be erased from each one of us. And we just simply, every experience that happens to us, good, bad, and indifferent, we hold it up to the template of the Word of God. And if it lines up, I accept it. If it doesn't, I don't care who said it, how good it feels, I don't want it. If it's not in the book, I don't want it. Help us, Lord, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit to guide us through all of life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.